Okay. So our next speakers are going to come up and talk to us about what SPORE is. Who are we and what does it mean? I'm going to welcome to the stage, and you just saw them a moment ago, but they're going to come up and do a, a bit more of a conversation with us. I'm going to ask Dr. Michelle Leish to come up. Perfect. Uh, Michelle Leish is a scientific director for Yukon's SPORE unit. She has been interested in health research since the beginning of her higher education. I'm not going to read her whole bio because you can read it in these wonderful programs, but I will tell you she's not your typical researcher. She's got a great sense of humor. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you got into when you asked me to the MC, just so you know. <laughs> I also want to welcome to the stage Lyris. Lyris, I'm just having trouble finding your bio, but I'm going to say Lyris was the first person that contacted me from Spore and said, hey, Tosh, I work for Spore. And I said, what is Spore? <laughs> and why do you work there? So Lyris holds two undergraduate degrees from the University of Saskatchewan and a baccalaureate of science um, and a whole bunch of other degrees. I'm not gonna read out all because there's a lot you've been busy, Lyris, I'm gonna say that. And she is currently working as the, uh, oh, no, we resigned, here we go. Lyris has remained active in her profession and re representing the Territory National Committee of Canadian Physiotherapy Association, and also received one of the 100 Centennial Medals of Honor in 2021. Congratulations, Lyris. And I'm gonna give it to you guys to take over and share with us what is SPORE. Thanks, Tosh. I appreciate it. Um, we can actually go to uh, the next slide. The whole thing didn't come up for some reason. There should be. There we go. Ta da. <laughs> so this is my magical skills that I also have, as well as my, my incredible sense of humor, Tosh. <laughs> um, so I'd first like to start off. I know Tosh already provided a land acknowledgement. Um, but in the spirit of reconciliation, I would like to also acknowledge that we live, work and play on the traditional territories of the Kwanlin Dun First Nation and the Ta'an Kwachun Council. I would also like to acknowledge that we have a hub in Old Crow on the traditional territories of the Vuntuk Gwich'in First Nation and a hub in Dawson City on the traditional territories of the Trondike Gwich'in First Nation. Um, in addition to that, this is actually a photo taken um, in fall of this year. This is one of my children's favorite camping spots at Kathleen Lake. So that was taken on the traditional territories of the Champagne and Ajac First Nations. Next slide, please. So just a little bit about me, who I am, where I come from. As you can tell from my accent, um, I'm not Canadian. I actually immigrated over here 11 years ago, um, where I did my postdoctoral research at the University of Toronto. And six years ago, I made my way to the Yukon after marrying a Canadian, a settler. Um, I love to do health research. It has been everything that I have done in my whole career. Um, every aspect from researching to talking to people that have health issues to trying to just find ways that we can support people within their health and improve health outcomes. I also love to bake with my kids. And this is a picture of me on what we call Stir Up Sunday, which is a British tradition where we make um, Christmas pudding in November and everyone in the family stirs it up and then it sits until Christmas time, um, typically in rum. Um, I'm the scientific director for the Yukon Spore Support Unit, as I already introduced. I'm also a mother to two beautiful young girls who are four and six years old, and they keep me very busy. Um, they love to explore this beautiful territory, and I feel extremely privileged to be raising them in this territory. Um, I'm a wife, a daughter, a sister, an auntie, and a friend. Next slide, please. And this is me. So I'm Lyris. Um, I've lived in the Yukon for over 30 years. I came up for the one to two year plan, as many people have. And I am here and I can't think of being anywhere else. I'm very fortunate to have a, a very rich journey. I spent a lot of my career uh, working here for the territorial government in health. I came in as a clinician, as a physiotherapist and worked um, in management and as a director at the um, end of my time with YG. Um, but more than anything, uh, my uh, life is really about the connections I have to the past 
and uh, the future generations. My mom is one of the pictures here on the very right top. She is 92. Um, if she doesn't walk 5 to 10K a day, she runs around and does the stairs in her condo um, and still actively plays golf three or four times a week. So she is, to me, um, the epitome of healthy aging and, and what I hope to aspire to be. Um, and my children, of course, are the light of my life and my little granddaughter who, um, oops, it's disappeared. Um, up at the top, and I am going to be the grandma of twins in the spring, so I'm quite excited about that. Um, so I came to uh, this position last year at the end of August as health, as the um, director, the scientific director, and moved into the position of health research chair um, in June of last year. So Michelle and I are working collaboratively, collaboratively together to move this uh, unit forward with our whole team and with people lived experience in the communities of Yukon. Just one other thing is I grew up in a very small town in Saskatchewan where my mom um, was a nurse, so that's my introduction to, uh, to healthcare. Uh, we used to have people coming to my home with um, you know, fish hooks in their face and um, bleeding and all kinds of limbs in different positions. So that was my first introduction of my mom being a, a volunteer nurse, um, and that sort of gave me the taste of what community-based care is, which is where my passion is. Next slide, please. Um, this is Yukon Territory. Many people from here, of course, know this, but we have 14 separate First Nations. 11 out of those have, um, have settled land claims, have self-governing agreements. And we have eight language groups, so it's very diverse. Um, and of course, we have a huge geographical um, expanse where we all, uh, we all live, and about a quarter of the population um, identifies as indig indigenous. Um, so, and a lot of that population is in the smaller communities outside of Whitehorse. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the health issues that are impacting Yukoners. This data was pulled from the 2018 Yukon Health Status Report, um, which I'd actually helped write um, through the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Um, so if we look at mortality rates, this is broken down by males and females, and it's listed from one to 10 as to the mortality rates, uh, the diseases that um, impact people's mortality. And so you can see that the, the number one cause of mortality in Yukon is for both males and females is cancer. We also have diseases of the heart as well as cardiovascular diseases. Um, diabetes is also in there. Alzheimer's disease. We've got influenza and pneumonia chronic liver disease and sepsis, as well as some of the causes of um, mortality in the Yukon. If we can move to the next slide, please. And so if we look at the cancer rates, um, as cancer is the leading cause of mortality in Yukon, we can actually break it down. Again, it's broken down here by males and females as to the um, types of cancer that are impacting Yukoners. And so when we look at both males and females, you can see that lung cancer is the leading cause um, of cancers in both males and females. Um, we've also got colorectal um, as one of the leading causes of cancer, prostate in males and um, breast cancer in females. You can move to the next slide, please. And some of the indicators um, of health determinants is la laid out here. And this is between Yukon and Canada. And so if we look at, for example, we saw that um, cirrhosis of the liver was one of the leading causes of death in the Yukon. And we can see that alcohol use and heavy drinking is far higher at 26% in the Yukon than it is across Canada at just 19%. Um, we've got smoking, again, is another um, one that comes out higher in the Yukon versus Canada. Colorectal screening is actually lower here which could account for why we're seeing higher rates of colorectal cancer um, compared to Canada. Um, contact with a dental professional, again, is lower here in the Yukon compared to Canada. We've got those that are living in a household with, it, with food insecurity. Again, the disparities between Yukon and Canada. Children that are vulnerable in early years of development is higher here in the Yukon. And obesity is also higher here in the Yukon. So all of these can impact Yukoners' health outcomes and then also impact our mortality rates. Next slide, please. 
So another priority for um, Yukon is, is supporting Indigenous health, and um, you can read this, so I won't read it out to you, but really um, we need to continue to challenge um, colonial practices that remain and are embedded within the health system, and part of that is to partner with with health service providers um, and employers as well as people with lived experience to explore um, what that means really to people that are being affected by the health systems. So um, this is also one of the priorities, which of course I want to talk to you about health in general to say that we think of health um, sometimes in a very narrow capacity, but from a sport perspective, we can see how health is so impacted by all the other areas within our life, including the connection to land and the climate change that's happening right now, as well as all the other factors that people sometimes are dealing with as far as challenges go with food insecurity, with um, housing, et cetera. Next slide. So Allison, this is your research. So Allison Perrin, who works in the Research Center, um, has done some work to look at research that's happened in the Yukon and, com and com some comparative analysis. So you can see here um, that health research itself, it's the little green guy, um, is a very narrow piece of the pie compared to NWT and, and Nunavut. Um, and if we look over on the right side, the research um, by territory, um, uh, it's very, very small little little uh, green line in the bottom. So we see that there is a real need to do research and to do it in a good way here in Yukon. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we have heard in the communities when we've been out there is that former research practices have happened with a helicopter flying approach. And so what's happened is that researchers have come in from institutes across Canada, they do their research, they collect their data, and they take that research back to their institute and are not heard from again. And this doesn't move us towards a path of reconciliation in any way. And so that's one of the things that as a unit, as a SPORE unit, we want to change. We want to make sure that moving forward, that we can build up really strong partnerships, as Catherine Smart was saying earlier, that we can build those up, that we can work together, that if First Nations have an area where they want to do research, we can, we can look at other institutes and we can find them and we can say, okay, this institute is doing a research in that area. They have that expertise. Let's partner with them. Let's work with them. Let's make sure they have what they need. Let's make sure we have research agreements in place. Let's make sure the researchers are taking OCAP training. Let's make sure that that research is being, the data from that research is being put back into the hands of the First Nation communities where it is taking place. Next slide, please. And one of our guiding principles is the document together today for our children tomorrow. And I know that many of you in this room will be familiar with this. This document was generated in 1973 by Elijah Smith. And together with a number of delegates, they went to Ottawa um, to talk to the then prime minister about this document. And in this document, there is a page um, that's written out about research and how research should take place. And I think it's really, really interesting because this document was written in 1973, but it is still so incredibly relevant to today. And I haven't written the whole thing out, but what I have done is I've paraphrased what they said, and I would like to take some time to read that to you because I think it's really important in how we move forward in doing health research and supporting health research in the territory. So we've got take advantage of the good parts of the white man way while keeping the best parts of our Indian way. If research is to be done, there must be conditions. We must decide what we feel needs to be researched. We may need some help, but we make the final decision. When I say we, please note that that is not spore unit talking. That is the words from the document. We must choose who will do the research. Research must include our people. We must learn the skills to do our research in the future. The research must belong to us. Much research has been done, but we are not able to access it. All recent research about Yukon Indians should be given to us. 
And I think it's really important that we reflect on each of those points. And as we build up our unit and we grow our unit, that we move forward in a positive way and we take all of that into account. So it's things like I said earlier about ensuring that First Nations have access to the data, that ensuring that First Nations are involved in the research process. And we can talk a little bit about that later when we talk about how we're trying to do that, but also about mentoring people in the community, building up the skills within the community so that they can start taking on research that they want to do. Next slide, please. So now to talk a little bit about where SPORE came from. So we focus on how to do health research. Um, we're not specifically involved in activating research projects, but we see, uh, Michelle mentioned before, we're kind of, we're kind of like a, a mediator that brings in research and connects it to the people with lived experience in communities based on their priorities. So we're one of 10 provincial territorial territorial units. Um, we There is only one territory right now, Nunavut, that's not represented by a SPORE unit. Um, and we have a five-year phase one grant, hoping that we would, uh, at the end of that, uh, qualify and be able to move into a phase two grant after that. So really it's about supporting patients, families, communities. And when we say the term patients, sometimes that bristles a little because people don't identify as a patient per se, but it is the term that's used um, from our parent organization. But really, it is a broad term in our perspective that means people that may have had experience um, receiving health services or supporting someone else who receives health services. So um, we want to look at it in the broadest way. And the term we tend to use in our unit is people with lived experience. So transforming them from passive um, recipients to active participants. And eventually, ultimately, we'd like to work ourselves out of a job, right? Um, so that it is actually directed and, and instigated by the people that know what it is they need and what they want. And we can just help facilitate that. So really, it is about the people that know what their needs are being able to be uh, the real strong force in bringing the research forward. Next slide, please. So I did mention we have an, uh, our, we're governed by an oversight committee, which is very broad. We have represented, representatives um, who are from different organizations and as well as um, from uh, the community. So we have two elders right now on our oversight committee. We have reps from First Nation governments and organizations. We have um, uh, people with lived experience, one youth and one non-youth, I guess. Um, and we have representatives from the government, from the hospital, uh, as well as the CMOH, and we have uh, NGO representation as well. And of course, um, I'd like to mention Bronwyn Hancock, who was really instrumental in getting the SPORE unit. She's the, um, the AVP of research, and she was involved in the business case that brought this unit forward and, and was able to get the grant funding. Next slide, please. Okay, so we have actually been working with Tosh and her teammate Davida recently to um, develop a strategic plan. Um, and we've been working on this together with our oversight committee, as well as our team. Um, and from this, we have our vision. I'm going to talk about our vision and also our values that have come out of our um, strategic plan. And so our vision is that Yukon is a recognized leader in co-created health research grounded in partnership among Indigenous and non-Indigenous government and non-government institutions that brings together all ways of knowing to help Yukoners face our shared challenges, leading to an improved patient experience and improved health outcomes for all residents. I should say that is a mouthful. We did actually talk about this in our strategic planning. This was in our, in our business case plan, but we didn't really want to change the, uh, the SPORE vision, but I did get it out there, Tosh. <laughs> um, we really want to focus on community-led projects um, that privilege Indigenous knowledge. Next slide, please. And so what we value, and we spent a lot of time um, with our oversight committee, with Tosh and Davida, going through what, are, what, what does our unit really value? What do we want to bring when we're talking about building um, health research, supporting health research within the territory? And so we want to ensure that the work of the unit reflects the priorities of the Yukon. We want Indigenous ways of knowing, being and doing to be a priority. 
We want equity for all genders and populations through research methods and research outcomes. We want to build and realize Yukon's capacity in health research. We want to take a holistic approach to health and wellness. We want to use a strengths-based approach to health and wellness research. We want to include the four R's of health research, respect, relevancy, reciprocity, and relationship. The principles of First Nations sovereignty, including OCAP, will be honored. Ethical approaches to research that are inclusive of indigenous ethics will also be honored. Data sharing and open research that can be utilized by Yukoners will be something that we will also be striving towards. Next slide, please. So what does this mean? So what this means to us is indigenous people, including elders, lead and collaborate on our research projects. It means the data collection values the principles of data sovereignty. So we enter into data agreements with communities, with organizations, so the data is owned and um, shared, and we make sure that we have a clear understanding of how it will be managed so that we don't do that helicopter approach. Um, the data collection methodologies adhere to Indigenous ways of knowing, doing, and being, and then we incorporate the values and the ways of knowing into our research process. Um, so that means that we really are led not only by the research project itself, but the way that we engage with communities. Next slide, please. So just to introduce, um, when we did our little introduction, there's two members that you weren't able to meet. So this is uh, Cody. So he is located in Dawson, and he is organizing the Dawson Hub online right now. Um, and he works in a position that we call the First Nation Community Research Coordinator. So he is embedded in the community and he works with the First Nation. He works, um, he will be working in multiple communities and he works with the community itself to um, build up uh, an advocacy group of people lived experience to connect to uh, research priorities and to just be um, involved in what the health system is within those communities. Uh, next slide. And the person leading our Old Crow Hub is Sherry Frost, and she is a research assistant supporting us um, in this project, which is separately funded from SPORE. It actually is uh, funded by CIHR, and it is uh, a co-created uh, research project that we're doing with VGFN, and we're, it's a one-year rapid response grant um, gathering information and the experiences and perceptions of people that live in the community on what happened during the COVID pandemic, um, some of the challenges, some of the lessons learned in the community. So she uh, lives, has, has grown up and lives in the community and is a real asset uh, to our team. Next slide, please. Wait, this is you. Thanks, Doris. I am actually going to add on a little bit to those two previous slides based on what I was talking about earlier about looking us looking at different ways that we can support research within the communities and trying to take more of an indigenous approach and not just a Western approach. And so, you know, one of the things that we've heard in the communities is that, you know, they don't want sport to be white horse focused not to forget about the communities. And so we've got Cody in Dawson, and the idea is that he'll be able to support Northern communities and help them with their research processes, do a lot of community engagement up there, be able to support youth in those communities um, in STEM related activities. So science, technology, engineering, and math, and try to encourage people again, as Dr. Smart mentioned in our keynote, to sort of get them involved in health and hopefully sort of help people move into um, career paths um, that are healthcare professionals. Um, we do actually have an open position right now for our southern communities. And so if anyone knows of anyone that is interested in health, they don't have to have a health degree, but we can support and mentor them. What's really important to us is that they understand communities and they understand what it is to be in a community, they understand what it is to talk to people, what it is to mentor people, and we can help support them on the health related aspect. So we do still have an open position for our southern communities, and they could be living anywhere in southern Yukon. And the second part of that is, as there is mentioned with Sherry Frost, Sherry Frost is our research assistant, 
She's Vintukwich in First Nation. She's lived in that community her whole life. She doesn't have a health research background, but we want to be able to support people that are in their communities to do that research. And that's really important to us. So the second project that we have going on right now is looking at um, healthcare worker burnout due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This has actually been funded by the government of Yukon. Um, it's a short funded project and it's the project that Mark is working on. Um, he introduced himself earlier. And the idea is that healthcare professionals, so we're focusing on nurses, RNs, LPNs, as well as physicians, um, to do a short survey and then an interview to hear about their experiences of being in the healthcare system and caring for people during the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, we're all very aware and we're hearing it in the news frequently about the healthcare system being on the brink. And we want to understand what does that look like in the Yukon? What are our doctors and nurses saying? what's working, what's not working, how can we support them? And this is being done in partnership with the Yukon Hospital Corporation, as well as the Yukon Medical Association, the Yukon um, RN Association, and the Yukon LPN Association. Next slide, please. Oh, I should also mention, as it was on the slide, that we also have two people with lived experience um, who are also supporting that work too. So helping us on an advisory group, um, come up with questions to ask, as well as analyze data. Um, and Lyris and I are both going to talk to this. So as we mentioned earlier, our SPORE um, unit is governed by an oversight committee. And one of the goals of the SPORE unit is to do a demonstration project within the community. And that demonstration project is to showcase what the SPORE unit can do. And we have worked with our oversight committee to um, come up with a project. And this project is actually going to focus on youth mental wellness. And I'll let Lyris talk a little bit more to that. So over the past year, both myself and Michelle have had a chance um, to get out to almost every uh, community. And we don't want to talk to anybody that wants to talk to us. Um, and so that might be people that are working within the First Nation government. It might be people that are um, involved in delivering health care. It might be citizens. It could be anybody in the community. One of the overwhelming concerns that's brought forward to us across the board is about youth mental wellness it's it's a priority that's been brought up multiple times so from that um we're we're hearing that very clearly and we also know that the the government has um instituted a, a health care emergency ar around this um that's as part of their health care emergency so we know that that's a priority um there's a lot of support through grant funding that's out uh through different national organizations so we're actively looking at that but we also know that we have the support of the oversight committee to look at this as a demonstration project so there's several uh first nation communities that have come forward to say they're very interested in partnering on this project so we are um, moving forward with applying for grants and um, working with our demonstration project as well and our first step really is just to get out there and um, connect with the communities and find out what are what are the challenges and what are the some of the things in the community that are really supporting wellness okay next slide please so we're just going to end on uh, this slide. well we have a thank you slide afterwards i think that'll be allowed right tosh <laughs> um but uh just to reflect here um and I was uh, I was up in Dawson City and I was speaking with Erin, who manages um, a lot of the, the youth mental wellness programs um, in Dawson. And one of the things that we were talking about um, in terms of incorporating Indigenous ways of knowing, being and doing is she said how important it is for us to take our time. And I think that's something that, you know, as a unit, it can be difficult when, you know, we have a lot of deadlines that we have to meet and we want to keep moving at a pace that suggests like yes we're getting these things done we've ticked this box we've done that but to stop for a moment and to reflect and to say okay it does take time it takes time to build relationships it takes time to build trust it takes time to to be in the communities and spend that time with people um, it takes time to do research it takes time to understand the processes 
It takes time to understand what the communities need. And so that's something that will be important to our unit moving forward and something that I want everybody to um, reflect on as well in their own ways. Um, the other thing I was going to add to that is about the time. And I think um, as researchers coming from uh, a very academic sort of Western perspective, um, there is there's a lot for us to learn. So this aspect of sitting back, um, engaging and self reflecting are vital to the work that we do. Um, and it becomes a part of all all the projects that we work on as well as the development of our unit. So um, that active reflection and um, openness to knowledge and learning that's different from what we've had before is essential to what we do. And this is our final slide. Um, thanking everyone um, that support, supports or have been part of our team um, and we continue to grow. And if there's anyone here that has interest in becoming more engaged in our SPORE unit, we are open, very open to uh, bringing more people on to be partners um, in, our, in our process. So I really appreciate your time and listening to us. Um, thank you so much for all of you for being here. And um, I look forward to the rest of today and tomorrow. Thank you. Good. Great, that was super informative. I have to say as a, a Yukon First Nation member, it really warms my heart when I see people reference together today for our children tomorrow. And you couldn't be more right that it's uh, still so relevant today. We're gonna open the floor for questions and comments. No, you can't all rush to the microphone at once in the room, be orderly. And for those that are online, you can either raise your virtual hand and, uh, and then we will spotlight you with a camera. By we, I mean Gunta, because they're good at that. And, or if you're shy, you can put your question in the chat and my good friend Cass will read it out. Okay, you can maybe rush a little more to the microphone, a little bit more. So I'm gonna ask Cass, who I understand has a question from online to read our first question for Michelle and Lyris. Also, congratulations on twins. Woo! That's exciting. <laughs> You are going to be running until you're 96 like your mom. Oh, we've got a question. Thank you. Go ahead. Masi Jo. Serena Zo. It's hard for me to speak. People who know me, my name is Ernie Letty. I'm thankful to be here. I've walked a long way. <laughs> Skied a long way. I came out of the mountains with my brother Winter as a, the NWT Yukon border closed down because of COVID. I'm here at the university now. I'm in the older workers program. First of all, I'd like to thank our ancestors here who are always with us as we pray. Our elders, our leaders, our frontline workers <clears throat> who struggle in community development for a long time to address these issues. as a Dene, as a Métis, as a human being. To find our way home after we get educated. I 
I was part of the Grolier Hall residential school. About 1963 to 1973. I've never shared this story before. Not with my mom, my family, my daughter. But it's time to heal. It's time to come home. I got to tell you where I come from. I come from Tulita, Port Normandy used to call it. That's where they took me from. I want to say uh, I'm really uh, glad this is happening. Spore. We're looking for a way. How do we address all these traumas, all these challenges? And you will find that the indigenous people are experts, masters of change, to go through what our people have to go through and come out of it. <clears throat> Without having all these traumas and addiction, addiction, addictive problems trying to escape. Can't even cry sometimes because you're all alone and you don't know how. In residential school, you cry. You're just a cry baby and they're gonna beat you up. You walk the streets, it's like that. They challenge you. Who are you? But I want to say this, um, I'm stepping up because in my family, all my aunts and uncles have left this world. I have my oldest sisters, younger sister. My oldest brother is gone. Lost one last year. My mom, my aunties. People ask me, how come you don't talk? <laughs> Not on Facebook. Because they wouldn't understand me. I'm talking about a giant. But what I want to share with you is that I'm so grateful for people who uh, are in the front lines that are trying to put a program, try to put something together so that we could address these issues. Well, there was one man that everyone knows that stepped up a long time ago. His name was Father Moshe. In my mind, I could see him, he come from the war and he came to BC, the Yukon. One man, he goes to Old Crow. He sees young people. Probably in his mind, he think, you know, they could cross country ski. He was all alone because there was two churches. But the people welcomed him. And over time, he produced the first Canadian champion, indigenous Martha Benjamin, recognized in the last 10, 15 years. While I was in residential school, they created the test program, Territorial Experimental Ski Training. And with coaches, with the board of the test program, they produced champions, Shirley and Sharon Firth, Fred Kelly, Bert Bullock, people who won Canadian championships, North American championships. Bert Bullock, my brother, he cried 
1974, he was going for the bronze medal. Three and a half seconds. That's how close we came. I missed the 72 Olympics. I was 19. I fell. Those falls, you, sometimes you don't get up from, didn't make it. Sent me home to Toledo. They went to the Olympics in Sapporo and then I ended up racing in the American Juniors with Bill Koch and Tim Codwell came in third after a month of losing good tracks and racing in Toledo. I was all alone. But I made the 76 and I went for the 80 when I was broken all alone in North Bay. Came home on a bus to drive cab. I ended up working for Denon Nation as a health director because I thought I had something to offer as an athlete who studied excellence. I live that life. <clears throat> but I want to say this, when I talk, I honor my elders, the people who come before me who, who gave me something. And while I was in Yellow Life in 83, Four Skies, Four Worlds Development, Eddie Belrose, Rebecca Martell. They came to a Yellow Knife and they had a four day workshop. At that time, I didn't know it as I did the research that they work with elders. They prayed in their ceremonies and they brought together something to do a four day which represents something in our world. It's very simple for him. Four days to see, to feel, to think, to do. It's in there, Four Worlds Development, the story. And I took that teaching along with going to sweats and going to ceremonies to Feather of Hope in the 90s, when HIV hit Edmonton, I was going to school taking Native Studies. I needed to work. So I went to work for Feather of Hope. And there again, Ken Ward and the board, we looked at this model. We went to our elders. Joe Cardinal and a few of them, Christine Daniels. They had prayers and ceremony in Blue Lake for seven days with the Alberta people to see if we could change a one hour presentation on HIV to four days. And it happened. It went across Canada, it went to the world uh, in Vancouver where I was one of six people from North America to talk about the immune system, about our culture, about how we don't have to die with HIV. That someone can tell you you're going to die when you have something. They're not God. But what I could work with is the immune system, mind, body, emotion, spirit. As I said, we are experts. We have gone through this. The only thing missing, I feel, is it's lost in translation. I speak English. I can't even communicate with my people. There's no translators here. Our people don't read those books, and you have to read thousands, maybe, to understand, but you still haven't made it from here to actually doing it. So my story is about walking in two worlds, this world and when I'm on the land, when I'm getting wood, 
when I'm starting the fire. That's my world. That's my home. But you don't see me in, you can't see me because I'm walking around this city. You don't know who I am. Maybe you're scared of me because that's the way it was back in the day. I was just an Indian. We were just Indians and Eskimos. You could read it in Time magazines, how we have conquered the world. But these Indians and Eskimos are real people. I do this for my daughter, Amaya, Nahani Joy, my friend Norman Betsina Blondin. One day I said, I'm going to come. I'm going to stand in a circle, and you're going to be there with me. And I'm going to tell you stories, because in our culture, a storyteller is really important. All our memories are there. That's why you go visit elders, you bring them tobacco, you bring them food, you sit with them, because they're going to tell you a story. And when they tell you that story, something in your mind is going to connect how we're all related. So I want to say that, I guess, I come here as a student, 68 years old now to get here, tell you this story. But it's time, it's time for me to heal. I had to go through some ceremonies to puke out this last part. <laughs> I didn't want to carry. I don't want to be mad no more. I don't want to carry anything with me <laughs> from that past, except the wisdom, things I've learned from it. Just a cross country skier. Skied with giants. Father Mushier, Birger Peterson. It's in books and Guts and Glory and Canada Ski Story. You'll hear what the new skiers did to break trail. So I'm honoring them today in my story as I write my story, as I share my story, as an indigenous person trying to come home, to be healthy again, to share my stories so that my granddaughter and all the children will know that it don't matter how difficult it is in that dark place, it's like an innocent, in a prison at Grolier Hall. And I, I'm not talking bad about the nuns and priests and people. I didn't know any better. But I was in there alone. And I kept alone all my life. My family wonder about me, why you don't talk? Because <laughs> I'm going to cry. <laughs> and I don't want to cry. So now you know. This is what it's going to take to talk in public, to share who I really am, what I'm trying to do here as a Dene, Metis, cross country skier, to share my story because that's my gift. I'm working on it at the university. I'm saying I want to. I'm a resource in the community. Now that you know me, uh, if you want me to come and share my story with the young people, what it's like, what it's like to go through that and come out of it, I'm here. The only thing I follow is protocol. I don't have a business and I don't think I'm gonna sell what I have. But if tobacco is there, in our way, you ask us, you open the door, because I can't tell you what to do. I have to respect you. So if you do it in that way with our elders, they'll understand that, that the Creator gave me a gift, and I'm going to give it back. So that's why I've taken time in this last while with people in the city to go through ceremony to clean myself. 
So when I talk, I won't hurt anyone. That's what my mom taught me, to be kind. Her home was always open. I see that, that's the way I walk. So I want to just share this little piece with you because I know that you're looking for a model and cross-country skiing test program is, is an awesome, there are champions all over. And if you ask them, my friend Angus Cogney, who I went through residential school, Carver, him too, he's sharing his story. He's helping people to say that despite what we went through, he skied to the North Pole. <laughs> his son is a champion too. So we're still going, I want you to know. Even though you don't see us cross-country skiers, we're still here, some of us. And maybe, uh, maybe you could use us. Must be true. Gwyneth Chase. Nice to meet you and Gwyneth Chase for your words and your strength. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Cass, we've got a couple comments online. I'll ask you to read out, and then I think uh, we're ready for our first break. All right, yeah, we had a couple of comments. Uh, Marian Promozik says, there was research done in Old Crow to determine that a high percentage of, I think, around 90% of the population at H. pylori, uh, Y was never determined. This would be interesting if this is prevalent in other Yukon communities and native population. A lack of doctors and health professionals in the Yukon are also an issue, and the high turnover of health staff that are only in the Yukon for a short duration before moving elsewhere. Um, and Helen Strappers says it's uh, yes, time builds relationships. Without these relationships, everything falls apart. Work needs to be done continuously to nurture these relationships. Humanity is key, not professional arrogance. And we have one other one. And Helen again says, uh, thank you for your kind words. Oh, sorry, that was earlier. Um, big hug, our friend for speaking. Uh, I hear him, I see him, I value him and applaud him. I wanted to share that. Thank you for our participants online. I'm just gonna go to Lyris and Michelle and see if you have any closing comments. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Ernie. Thank you to all the people online that had comments as well. Um, yes, this is, this is going to be a long process because we need to invest in finding the right ways to go forward together um, in dealing with some of these real, real challenges that we're facing. Um, so, uh, and I know you're all a part of this because you're here. So um, we look forward to the journey. Uh, we know there'll be challenges along the way, uh, but we also know there's so much strength and so much knowledge that is embedded in in everything we do in the Yukon. So um, we are excited about moving forward. I will just echo those sentiments. Thank you. Great. Thank you guys so much. Another round of applause. Thank you. Well done. Okay. So please remember all of that information on SPORE. There will be a quiz tomorrow afternoon. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but if there was, I would definitely fail that quiz. We are going to go to our first morning, and this is called a networking break. So it's not your time for a nap. It's your time to learn and meet new people and go and experience things. Except for those of you online, you can have a nap. Uh, we want everybody back in this room at 1038. Huh? Very specific. 1038. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>